you don't get to decide what is spam and what is not. It's up to the recipient. Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Jeremy, founder of QuickMail.io. Hey, this is Jack from emailsthatsell.com slash spam. In this episode, Jack and I are going to revisit what it means to be a spammer these days. You'll hear us sharing our thoughts on how to spot a spammer, what to look for, and what numbers you should be hitting. If you think this applies to you, stick to the end as we give some actionable advice you can use to make sure you stay on a path to mastery. So today the episode is about how to recognize a spammer. If you're listening to our show, maybe you're a longtime listener, I got news for you. It doesn't automatically mean that you're not a spammer. And I think, if I'm being honest, maybe, Jeremy, we've been a little soft on the cold email community. I think we really need to bring in what it means to be a spammer and just sort of check yourself. Are you a spammer? You got to know. I am Sunday of the week, not every day of the week. I think there's a difference between, I don't know, maybe this happens to you, but if you tell people who are outside the email space or even the startup space or even the sales space, if you tell them you do this podcast on cold email, they're like, ah, spam. Yeah, I get those. Oh, that's true. I got that too. And I think there's a fundamental difference between spammers and cold emailers. And today I want to make that really clear. That's fine. So let's start with the definition of a spam. So what's a spam then? I think we did it on episode one because it's like the core of everything. Yeah. But can we summary that into a quick word? Yeah. Spam is unwanted mail. There you go. That's it. And a spammer is someone who regularly sends unwanted mail. <laughs> right? The key word here is regularly because I do send some email right. sometimes that people don't want to receive for sure. It's true. It's like... You're not perfect. You don't know exactly where your prospects are at, but there's a certain process that you can own if you want to send great cold email. And for spammers out there, there's a certain process they own. They're going for the volume game, their shotgun spray and pray approach. And it's so different. It's almost important to clarify here. So going a little bit further, I think spammers or the difference between a spammer and a cold emailer, notice how cold emailer are the good guys, right? Like us. <laughs> and you're listening. You're a good guy, hopefully. I think the big difference is about the way you build your list. That's almost enough to make a distinction between are you a spammer or are you a cold emailer? Yeah, I remember we had this conversation about cold content versus prospect list building. And I think you're right. You know, if you nail down your list and your audience, then, you know, getting the message across is much easier. And then you can make sure that at least there is a high chance of them being interested in, in your email and, and your offer. It's true. But I've got a major difference today than I originally had when we recorded episode one, which was this cold email spam. And today, back when we recorded episode one, I used to think anyone who buys a list, they're a spammer. And for the most part, if you just use a database, to just you know, instantly create a list of 5,000 prospects, that's very spammy behavior. And today, I almost want to revise that because it really doesn't matter. I mean, like one of the best sources for quality prospects, I would say, is directory like LinkedIn that's automatically refreshed by the users. So the data is probably accurate and up to date, right? Like that's Pretty, it could be a really good source for leads. But I actually think if you don't put the right filters, even if you use a great source for your leads, you're going to end up with a general list of people that probably don't want to hear from you. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm thinking that Sales Navigator and LinkedIn and those sort of directories actually rarely give us the type of signals that will make sure that will help in making sure that the prospect is interested or is in that space because you know someone can qualify as being i don't know a cto or a chief marketer whatever yep but the lifespan of the career of that person actually very different needs at very different times you know so it's i don't think it's good enough it, right so it's just maybe the first step but like you said if you're listening to the show if someone's tuning in 
Maybe they're saying, well, what do you mean? I, I mean, my ideal prospect is a CTO. What am I missing, Jeremy? Well, like I mentioned, the CTO may have a problem with recruiting at that time and is not really interested in something else. And if you come with something else, well, you know, that's a miss. But you can't really know it. And maybe in two months' time, they wouldn't care about recruiting. And if you come with a recruiting problem, then again, you miss the opportunity at that time. And there isn't a directory that says, oh, I don't know if I know one, that'll be cool. <laughs> that says like, hey, I need X and Y now. You know, please contact me with any offer you have that may help solving this problem. Maybe Quora, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe there is some stuff around, but it's hard to find a process that is repeatable for that. And let's take buying lists for a second, because it's possible you could buy a list today that's going to be hotter than something that you could build using Sales Navigator. And <laughs> perfect example, I was talking to a client who was targeting people, let's say, at a particular conference. And not just people at a particular conference, but people who bought a booth at a particular conference. But beyond that, people who bought a booth that was at least 20 feet by 20 feet, and they spent at least $12,000 a day to sponsor the event. That's a pretty damn good list. And I don't know anywhere else online that you could find those details for that kind of prospect. So I'm really at a place where I need to back up a second and, you know, to be clear, it's hard to find a list you could purchase that is better than one you could build from scratch using, you know, just good old fashioned elbow grease. But occasionally you could buy a list that's better than something like LinkedIn, assuming that maybe you use the list to indicate companies because maybe the contact person on that list has been bombarded by emails. But maybe if you use it as a starting point. Yeah, but let's look at this from this angle. I think it's a fair point. But again, it's like, it's at that time, what is the value of this list in five years' time? Nothing. Completely nothing. Exactly. Right? So it needs to be fresh. So that list needs to be built one way or another, and it can be built by someone else. Like you mentioned, you know, conference that, you know, sell the list of attendees or specific, you know, vendors or whatever. Then that's okay. That's in that time frame. And maybe that list is still valid for two months. And then after that, people will think of something else and life goes on. Yeah. And you may have missed, but there is basically a window of opportunity with each list. The problem is like most of the lists are just reused and the window of opportunity is long gone. And I do have to mention that uh, there happens to be a pretty recurring issue with data quality. So, for example, you may have a list with all of these magical filters that you could never find elsewhere, but it may come with a 21% bounce rate, which is yeah. garbage, you know. So let's talk about that. If you want to know, this podcast is about, are you a spammer, basically? How do you identify a spammer? One of the most obvious stats that probably we'll both agree on is your bounce rate. Oh, good. We're disagreeing. <laughs> <laughs> we're not really disagreeing, but I'm just thinking like before it bounces, there is indication that, you know, this is spammer. The reason why I'm saying that is because we're doing some work as well on QuickMail. There are a lot of users. Some of them are doing some dodgy things. The interesting thing for, just a side note, I think it's important or it's interesting for the audience, is that by raising our prices, we prevented spam tremendously. At the beginning, we were like not cheap, but we were not very expensive either. And so we had a lot of uh, people who thought that economically speaking, that made sense to use a platform like mine. And the easiest way to get rid of those people was simply to raise the price a little bit. And then it becomes economically not worth doing. And so, you know, we have less and less spammer. That's fine. So interesting. Now we don't have so much spammer by trade, but we do have spammer by lack of education, misleading, or in a hurry. Fast, fast, fast results, right? Yeah, absolutely. And for me, there is some signals that signal someone is going to do some spammy stuff even before they actually do spam. So I can figure out if they are spammer before they even send the first email and receive the bounces. So to come back to what you were saying about the spammy level being linked to the bounce rate, sure, it's super true, but at the same time, I can deduce it before even the first email is sent. Let me try and guess. Okay, yeah, try and guess. Does it have anything to do with the list size that they upload? Um, 
I wouldn't think so necessarily because a lot of big businesses may have like big list of like lots of leads and that's fine. That's not a problem. All right. Last chance. What about the number of merge tags used? Uh, that's part of it. But I would say basically it's the amount of personal inboxes like an ad Gmail, ad Yahoo, ad Google. Those sort of things signal to me that you're probably not in the right mindset or space to do B2B type of emails. And therefore, it's stand a higher chance of, you know, getting flagged as spam even before you even start. What else is an indicator for you if, I mean, maybe the campaign's up and rolling? You know, what's one of the first things? Before even sending a first email, there is also the actual content on the copy of the email. You know, if it comes with lots of bullet points, like a six-pager, just explaining you how great their service is. I mean, no one is wish, waking up on the morning wishing, you know, <laughs> to have like a, a long six-page email to read, telling about the benefit of something that is probably, you know, remotely interesting, if any interest at all. Right. So, yeah, at some point you, you have to wonder. But to come back to your questions about figuring out, you know, if that's a spammer or not, very quickly... And talking about the merch tag that people are using, I think it's super easy from a setup standpoint to figure out if someone has an intent to spam, willingly or not, like I mentioned, right? Some people are doing it without necessarily noticing it per se because they think they got a great offering and they want to get it as fast as possible. I'm just doing cold email. Yeah, exactly. And so what will happen is that they won't field any field when they will set up their account, they will try to go as fast as possible, like, you know, creating a quick name. The name of the campaign is not really well thought either. There's just one template. There's like minimum number of action before sending, basically, will lead to probably someone who is actually not going to have a great success. Okay, so basically the person who's setting up a campaign in a hurry is very likely doing some spammy activity. Yeah. Now, I've got a theory here that explains why, and, and keep in mind, if this is you, I'm, I'm not particularly saying that you are a spammer, you have spammer <laughs> characteristics. I just think you're... You know you are. <laughs> no, it's, it's, um, you may have a lot of room for improvement that you might not have considered before. So I think at the end of the day, spammers have one thing that they can use to their advantage, and that's volume. And they need volume because their numbers are low all around. They've got low opens, low replies. So volume is the last thing they really have. And because as soon as you start playing this volume game, it becomes extremely difficult to do things like personalized messages, to segment your prospects into different buckets and campaigns. Because when you are at a scale of thousands, well, good luck trying to make everyone feel like they received that email individually. It's just crazy expensive, extremely time consuming. So there's even more of a reason to just hurry up, get it out there, play the numbers game and let's rock and roll. It's a bit like the desperate type of person, you know, just it is. using the last weapon they have. And without even glancing at quick mail stats, I'm sure their reply rates are the lowest across the board, across all users. It's like this type of campaign. Sure, those persona that try to minimize the setup while maximizing the volume are definitely not in the right mindset for right. cold email, for sure. Now let's look at like cold emailers on the other side of the spectrum. So they don't need to rely on volume because they're getting healthy reply rates, their open rates, their deliverability is great, and they can afford to send to smaller batches of prospects. And when you are sending to 50 or 100 prospects, in a segment, well, it's fairly doable to add good personalization and some fancy merge tags that just double up on the replies that they're getting. So it's almost like if you take the volume approach, good luck to you. It's going to be really hard to get a, a decent reply rate. And if you take a small batch approach, you've got a lot of things to your advantage. You can maybe add people on social platforms or maybe even pick up the phone on a couple prospects that either reply in or click a link or open a bunch of times. You can just do things that at volume you can't, which is sort of a nice thing about being a cold emailer that's not playing the numbers game. So that's all well and good. How are that going to help a listener right now? Well, I've got a couple of stats that indicate for me if you may be doing some spammy behavior and 
if that's the case, I think it's time for a little pause and just reassess what's going on just to see if maybe you can take a different angle, you know, find a hotter list, spend slightly more time with each prospect and, and actually get more leads in the door. Because that's sort of the, the side benefit here is if you do a great job cold emailing, your lead generation efforts will be a lot more profitable. So for example, I think if your open rates are below 40% per touch, that's an indication that something may be wrong with your deliverability. And it could be because a lot of people have hit the report spam button. So I'm going to use open rate as an indicator that you may be not following the best practice here. Jeremy, do you think that holds up on your side? Yeah, that's exactly the number we give. Under 40%, there is big problems. Only if you enable open tracking as well. But do you think if somebody has a 35% open rate, it's fair to say that they are likely doing some spammy behavior? Or do you think that's a little bit too much to assume? I think they've been burnt. It doesn't mean necessarily they're going to do some bad things. It could be that it's too late in the process. What's important, we're not really talking here, is that you can't really start as a master. Like, hey, you know, even last week my campaign bombed. You know, I had like crickets. And so obviously from the point of view of the recipient, it means, you know, they didn't like it, which is okay. So now and then, you know, I'm going to send emails that people are not happy with. And so they're going to consider me a spammer. So with the difference here is I'm not trying to crank up the volume to desperately get one person to answer to me. Yeah. I'm actually pausing the campaign, I'm reviewing it, and then I'm going to restart it with either reviewing my list and seeing, am I really aligned here with what I'm proposing or reviewing the benefit, putting myself in their shoes and basically do this work about like iteration and try to improve as I go. And what's the alternative to that? If you just said, ah, screw it, I'll, I'll dump in <laughs> a couple hundred more. I mean, no, like the, you, you could try that. And sure. I think what we're getting at is in the long run, it pays to be a cold emailer and it's the spammers that are missing out. I mean, really, you're going to find if you take this approach, like you said, just pause, go back through the copy, go back through the list, maybe make some adjustments. Your business will grow because of it. You'll be wealthier. You'll have like a more constant lead stream. So I'm just I love that mentality of just stop and reflect instead of just add more fuel to something that's not working. I think that's a key difference here between a spammer and a cold emailer. So let's look at one other stat here. I'm also looking at reply rates. So just picture, you know, your prospect, if they're sitting at their desk, you know, they got their phone next to them, their, their stapler, their laptops open, and they see your email. If you are doing a halfway decent job, you know, you're really doing what Jeremy mentioned, and you're taking time to put yourself in the prospect's shoes, you're trying to match the, the list with the offer, I believe it's pretty easy to see above a 10% reply rate. I feel like if you're getting less than 10% of your prospects after your campaign said and done with a couple of follow-ups, then something's going on here. You may, most likely you're asking your prospects either too much, so you have a very high commitment call to action, or there's just not a match. You're pitching something to that CTO that has nothing to say to your offer. It's just a wrong fit. I don't think there is any whistle to blow here. Anyone knows that if you're getting 5% or less reply rates, you're probably not in good enough state to be able to have a successful campaign. As you will need more leads, you're going to run into problems very quickly because of the volume. So you need to get a minimum of 15 to 20%. Reply rate. Reply rate. If you had asked me a couple of years back, I would have put this to 30% and more, but now it becomes harder and it's understandable that not everyone will get as a good reply rate as they used to be to have in the past. I want to go back really quick to something we mentioned on the very first episode, and that is you don't get to decide what is spam and what is not. It's up to the recipient. And if you keep this in mind, you can allow yourself a little bit of mistakes as you are crafting your email process and getting better at this uh, outreach effort. But I think the major difference here, and this is important if you want the most number of leads generated and if you just want to be great at cold email, it's like just having this mentality. Pretty much exactly what Jeremy said was when things don't go right, don't 
lean to volume. You know, figure out what's broken here. Maybe it's the offer of the list or both, but that's the mentality that is going to pay off as opposed to this shotgun, let's get it out there and, you know, kind of the spammy stuff. So that's key difference. You know, it's a key difference here. Like we keep on mentioning, if one approach doesn't work, then try something else. It could be that your audience is more receptive to one thing and not the other. So yeah, keep perseverating, but don't use volume. Exactly. Big difference. I'm actually thinking that even if you send love letters or that compliment to people without asking anything in return, you're probably going to have some people skeptical, some people going to insult you, whatever, you know, you can't really please everyone at the end of the day. So even the best cold emailer will still have some hard patch. Yeah, it's super true. And actually, that reminds me, the Nike CEO is under some fire right now because of uh, an athlete they sponsored. But one of the things they said was, it's more important to pay attention to people that are fans of your brand, that love what you're doing, than it is to people who hate you or, or don't like what you're doing. It's the positive replies that we should be coming back to to gauge our success, not so much the negative messages. I'm into that. I forgot to mention, I've got a, a quiz on my site, emails at sell.com slash spam. It's got a couple of questions, and if you fill it out, it'll basically give you like a spam rating, see how close you are to spammy behavior. So check it out. Oh, I thought that was like advice on how to spam the right way. <laughs> <laughs> and how to buy a list from you, your selling list now, right? That's the next podcast. <laughs> Great cast, Jack. Great cast, man. To recap, here are the stats that indicate there might be something spammy going on with your campaign. First, as you're building your list, you need to have a clear reason why your prospects want to hear from you. And second, understand that all lists are time sensitive. Now, once you start sending, watch your stats. You don't want more than 5% bounce rate, below a 40% open rate, or below a 10% reply rate. Don't panic if you're seeing low numbers today. After all, you'll never be 100% sure that every prospect on your list will appreciate getting your message. If your campaign isn't working, don't rely on volume. Instead, go back and review your list and your call to action before ramping things back up. That's the biggest difference between spammers and true cold emailers. Hey, cold emailer. Yeah, you. If you got some value from this episode, give us a high vibe by sharing a two-sentence review on iTunes. Or Stitcher or TuneIn. That works too. It's a quick way to help other growth-minded folks like us find this podcast. So they can send awesome emails. And make everyone's inbox a better place. Thanks. Thanks.